All right, folks, welcome back. We're going to talk about inflation today and a concept known as the Phillips curve. And this information will be in Chapter 32 of your book, pages 860 to 882. We're going to talk about a couple of things today. One is what is the Phillips curve and what does it measure? What does it tell us? Uh, we'll talk about different types of inflation. I'll introduce you to the concept of an inflation tax. And uh, we'll talk about this idea known as the classical model of the price level which is a, a slightly different way of viewing the macro economy than what we have been talking about. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. First, we want to look at what we left off with last time, which is this idea of neutrality of money, which said that if we're at long-run equilibrium and the government pursues a, an expansionary monetary policy, they can shift aggregate demand to the right, which would lead to a temporary increase in real GDP. But with that increase in GDP comes a rise in prices, and that rise in prices impacts producers. The profit per unit for producers will drop, and as a result, their short-run aggregate supply will shift back to the left until it reaches long-run equilibrium at potential output. And that new potential output, or that equilibrium, is at the same potential output as before the expansionary policy, but with higher prices. And so as a result, we saw this idea of neutrality of money, which tells us that as money supply increases, price levels increase with an equal percentage change. And so there is no real impact in the long run for the economy for changing monetary policy. Um, and that's the same for fiscal policy as well. And that is that you cannot permanently grow the economy by increasing government spending and decreasing taxes or by increasing the money supply. You have to do something else. And that something else is something we'll cover in a few days. Um, so then the, the question we have to ask ourselves at some point here is, um, how long does it take to get to the long run? And the answer is it just kind of depends. Um, which is why the government is willing to pursue policies like this that will in, fa in fact lead to an increase in price level because the long run and the short run uh, may be separated far apart. We'll talk about that in just a second. First off, let's talk briefly about inflation. There are two different types of inflation that um, you should know about. One is caused by a change in aggregate supply and that's known as the cost push inflation. This is the stagflation that we talked about earlier in the year where there's a left shift in the short run aggregate supply curve like the oil shock of the 1970s where we went from equilibrium and then oil became more expensive and other commodity prices rose and we saw a left shift in aggregate supply which led to less output and higher prices. That's cost push inflation and there's not a whole lot, we talked about this, there's not a whole lot government can do about it. The other type is what we call demand pull inflation and that is something the government can do something about because they can create it. That's where we see a shift in aggregate demand to the right caused by expansionary fiscal or monetary policies. So any sort of fiscal or monetary expansionary policy will lead to a move from equilibrium to a new short-run equilibrium with aggregate demand pushed out to the right. However, like we said, because money is neutral, this demand pull inflation will eventually end up with much higher prices but with the same amount of output as before. One of the expansionary policies that you should be aware of is this concept of monetizing the debt. It's a, a strategy that the Federal Reserve pursues to help kind of pay for and fund the national debt. And so what they do is create money to pay the government's bills. Um, and by monetizing debt, what I mean is that they go out and they will purchase through open market operations, purchase the debt. Um, the federal debt that's held by individuals and institutions by and therefore increase the money supply. As a result, what they're doing is raising prices and creating this concept of inflation. As a result, individuals suffer what is known as an inflation tax. The value of the money you hold today is worth less today than yesterday because of inflation. And so um, the loss in purchasing power due to expansionary government policies um, is, is captured in this idea of inflation tax. So one example is where a 5% inflation per month, you end up with, instead of a uh, dollar in one month, um, is worth 95 cents today. So next month's dollar is only going to buy you 95 cents worth of stuff today. And as your money becomes worth less um, through inflation, that can create some problems for governments, particularly this concept we'll talk about in a moment known as, um, known as hyperinflation. So, but why then? Why does government bother to pursue this kind of policy if they know that it's going to create inflation and pain for people? And the short answer is because it won't cause pain in the short run. 
because of sticky wages, because of the short run aggregate supply curve. In the short run, we'll see an increase in output and a slight increase in prices. And um, the further the short run is from the long run, the more sense a policy like this uh, would make. They're there to ease the short-term pain, and if that means inflation in the future, then it may be worth it, depending on how painful the short run was without the expansionary government policy. Um, but that assumes that there is a sticky wages kind of short-run aggregate supply. There is a different model out there known as the classical model, which would tell us that there is no short run. It assumes that there's immediate change in the market, that a change in money supply will lead to automatically lead to higher prices without much hesitation at all. And um, the classical model sometimes actually works out. And we'll see places like Zimbabwe where there's immediate price response to a change in money supply. And that's where we begin to get into the concept of hyperinflation, where changes in government policy lead to an immediate change in inflation and a massive change in inflation. Um, and that's a place like Zimbabwe where they can see prices change by 25,000% in a day. Um, and so the classical model does have some legitimacy uh, when we start talking about things like monetizing debt, because particularly in countries that are experiencing high inflation already, it can create instantaneous inflation and kind of outweigh the, the short-term benefits that, that maybe an infusion of monetary policy might have for an economy. So we'll watch a video on in Zimbabwe and, and you'll get a, a better sense for what that means. In general, hyperinflation works this way. The Fed would monetize the debt. They would increase money supply by paying uh, for debt held by individuals. But as a result of rising inflation, the, the inflation tax kicks in and, and people want out of money. They, their money is worth less, will be worth less tomorrow than today. So they're going to try and move into commodities or purchase products to get out of money. Um, and as a result, the real money, because the prices rise, the real money in the economy gets less. And so the Federal Reserve has to monetize more debt, increase the money supply some more. And that forces people to get out of money even faster than they were before. And therefore, there's more inflation than there was before, which means they have to increase the money supply more. And it's kind of a rinse and repeat situation where you just see it building on itself until it gets completely out of control. And so hyperinflation is a concern and can be caused by some expansionary monetary policies. It's not always the case in the United States, but it is the case in other parts around the world. Next thing we want to talk about briefly is this idea of the Phillips curve, because inflation is uh, something the government has to trade off with, um, with and that comes with an unemployment. The, um, the Federal Reserve in particular is tasked with keeping inflation down and unemployment down. And so um, there is a trade off between the two. So let's just take a look at it. First off, let's ask ourselves this question, what happens to unemployment and prices when our aggregate demand curve shifts to the right. And when it shifts to the right, we see a higher price level and higher short run aggregate uh, output. And we could also ask ourselves what happens to unemployment and prices when aggregate demand shifts to the left. And we see that unemployment will rise, but prices will drop. So when there is a, in, a inflationary gap, we see that unemployment will drop because there's more and more people working. We're producing beyond our potential output, but that leads to higher prices. And when we see a recessionary gap, fewer people are working, so unemployment goes up, but inflation goes down. And so as a result, we've created what's called the short run Phillips curve, where inflation rate is on the vertical axis, unemployment rate is on the horizontal, and it tells us that with higher inflation rates comes lower unemployment. With uh, higher unemployment, we see lower inflation rates and sometimes negative inflation rates. And so there's a trade-off between the two. We can pursue um, high employment policies. We can push the unemployment rate towards zero, but the result is going to be higher rates of inflation. So the question is, how much do you want to accept uh, in inflation for lower levels of unemployment? And that's kind of what the Federal Reserve is constantly juggling um, when they're making their decisions. One thing to keep in mind with the Phillips curve is that it's based on expected inflation, that, that uh, people will make decisions based on what they expect to have happen to them in the economy. And so if we had a short run Phillips curve, uh, 
uh, short run Phillips curve sub zero, we see that the unemployment rate would be 6% with a 0% inflation rate. That means also though that if the inflation rate were 2%, the unemployment rate would be 4%. But if people expect a 2% inflation rate, then in the long run, from one moving from one short term situation, short run situation to the other, that they would ask for a 2% increase in pay. And if they ask for a 2% increase in pay, then we would expect there to then be a little bit more in the unemployment because they would begin to price some people out of the market. Um, employers would not want to pay 2% more in wages for the same amount of workers. And so we would see that um, that unemployment might go up to 6% again with a 2% in inflation rate. And that would give us a new short run Phillips curve. And so as people expect changes in inflation, they will behave in a certain way that will cause um, there to be a shift in the short run Phillips curve. The most important thing out of all of this is to just keep in mind that there is this, this trade-off uh, between the inflation rate and the unemployment rate. The government cannot pursue both low inflation and high employment without recognizing that there is going to be a trade-off between the two. And we'll do some more practice on Phillips curve, we'll do some more practice on inflation, and we'll watch a couple of videos about monetizing debt and hyperinflation in Zimbabwe when I see you in class tomorrow. Have a great night.